The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the deep true mind of the Tathagata. So Roshi has um, occupied this afternoon and asked me to talk a little bit about um, beginner's mind um, and a little bit more about the French horn and how they might be connected. And so um, I had actually been playing the flute for a little while when my orthodontist told me uh, when I was 10 that I needed to switch to a brass instrument because the flute was making my overbite, I think it was an overbite, worse. So I had to find something with an equal embouchure that doesn't make your mouth uneven. And so I was looking at the different brass instruments to try to pick one. And I noticed that the French horn section only had one student and I wanted to be first chair. So I thought, well, I think I can take him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I decided to uh, switch to the French horn and um, I knew I would have to play catch up to be able to um, eventually be first chair. So I could play all of the really wonderful solos. That's when you're in band and orchestra. Most, most of the fun parts are played by the first, at least in the French horn section, by the first and third chair, first chair especially. Otherwise you're relegated to a lot of long notes, which are just that, they're long notes that you can play for many, 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 many measures. And uh, often the notes will change, but it's still basically one long note after another with some, you know, there's some variety too. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I'm trying to explain how much I did not want to play long notes forever, but I had to anyway, because the flute you can sort of play, at least I learned to play a little bit from higher up in my, um, lungs somehow, I didn't have to put much effort into it to play the flute. But when I switched to the French horn, um, I it felt like I was going to pass out because the air has to go through so many coils. It's, it's actually, if you think about a trumpet that's really, 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 really long and then coiled up, that's the French horn. So you have to put your air through so much material to get a sound. And so uh, it took me a while to figure out how to breathe in a way that I could make some decent music without passing out. My teacher told me at the time I needed to learn how not to play like a girl. <laughs> that was what was required. And ultimately that meant breathing from the hara. And eventually I did figure that out. And so as I was playing these long notes, I noticed that I would often sort of fall into this place of not thinking, but not blankness, awareness, and a, a sense of calm and peace, and a sense of oneness too, at times. And that seemed pretty amazing. And it enticed me to go further with it. I wound up uh, playing several hours a day when I was young. And then as I got older, I played um, sometimes six or eight hours a day, which was pretty crazy. But uh, the reason I did that is because to some extent, I was able to open to a beginner's mind that place of that source, that source of creativity, the source of all of life really, but anybody in the creative arts recognizes that source, that, that place that everything comes from. It's really hard to play music when, when you're not open to that because otherwise it becomes kind of wrote and doesn't have the spirit that um, 
people find so inspiring about music. So the way I did the whole notes is a lot like how it can be helpful to do susokan. So you let the breath fall out naturally and then you extend it like you're playing a whole note if, for those of you who play fast instruments and know what this is like. You're just, you're just blowing and it's with your whole being. And there's this sensing that you're doing. You're not thinking overtly about what's coming next. You're aware of what is going on around you, but there's a very significant part of you that's just functioning as a, as a sensing, questioning, open curiosity with presence. So it's very hard to describe, but I'm trying. So if we think about beginner's mind, that's it. It's just, it's being open to possibility, fully present with your whole body from your heart. And so this is how I've practiced for a long time too, in many ways, because to do so so gone, you need to be fully present and fully in your body, breathing out as far as you can with curiosity. And it really is like you're singing the song of Zazen, if, if if you remember that from the chants, Hakuin's Song of Zazen, it really is like, um, well, there are a lot of metaphors you could use, but um, <laughs> I don't have any more. In that realm, in that realm, it's it's just uh, just like that, just openness, listening, and playing that out breath or playing that whole note with your whole being, sensing what needs to come next, but not thinking about it. So you're just really only in the moment. A lot like Meadow, if anyone can hear on the audio, Meadow is outside the door, not really sure what's going on right now. And so the beginner's mind is, is just living in that presence and breathing. I wonder if we could let her in maybe. <laughs> I wish that uh, we're not distracting, but it is a bit distracting. Maybe she'll be calm if she comes in for a sec. Okay, so I don't want to dwell on this, but I want to sum it up then we can move on. Uh, so basically, when, <laughs> when, when we're wanting to, to practice in, in a wholehearted way, being completely present, uh, we can do this in any moment. We can do this when, when Meadow wants to walk in the Zendo. We can do this when uh, somebody knocks on the door, when we're, we're trying to focus being open to that disruption, being open to how we need to function in each moment. That happens when we're playing music. It happens when we're functioning in our daily life. And what I'm trying to get to is how it can be when we're trying to focus when we're, we're sitting, because that is a really important um, part of practice in addition to, of course, functioning in daily life and bringing our practice into daily life. So I just want to get back to that that place of, of how possible it is to open to beginner's mind to that that source of who we are through the breath. And and we can do that by just focusing wholeheartedly, breathing out to the very end of the breath, and then coming back in. And there's nothing else except that breath. Just like when we're playing music, there's nothing else but that music. And um, I know Roshi's told the story about um, 
a shakuhachi player who, uh, you know, started to learn the craft in Japan and heard about sui zen, which is the blowing zen, which is um, a form of zazen that you practice um, with the shakuhachi flute. And so he went into the mountains for six months and just played every day for six hours, just blowing, just doing susokan essentially. But with that, uh, I'm sure with that sense of creative openness, that is really helpful for opening our minds to something beyond our usual patterns. And so after six months of that, he went back to his original teacher and his uh, original teacher of the shakuhachi was blown away by how much he had advanced in the place he had gotten to. And so um, I hope this is helpful in some way. I think sometimes it can be, at least from in my experience, it's been helpful to look at how to do the practice from other perspectives. Um, and I think the creative arts are the best way to do that in many ways because it's not really different to open up to that source of creativity. Um, you have to open up to original mind, which is living without expectations. Just completely in just this moment, nothing outside it. And that, that can happen outside the creative arts too. Um, a lot of people talk about flow, getting into the flow uh, when they're working on a project. Um, if people in IT, people in the sciences, Einstein uh, used to trick his mind into, or trick his, um, his subconscious into, I think, opening to that original mind, that beginner's mind. He would have a problem he couldn't solve, and then he would take a nap with his keys in one hand, just kind of hanging off the side of the bed. And then uh, when he woke up, he would drop the keys and that would startle his uh, mind into that place of not knowing and he would have his answer. So it happens across disciplines and uh, It's a place in our mind that we all have access to. It's just a matter of practicing opening up to it. So practice in music can help with that. Um, certainly Einstein had his practice for how he could open to it. And then of course we have Zazen as well for opening to that mind, which is ultimately not special and here informing everything we're doing at all times. It's not separate from us. It is us. Um, and it's that understanding that allows all of us really to function from a place of compassion because it's that part of us that recognizes we are all one being. There's a the, the first sort of saying from the Buddha in the Diamond Sutra says, no bodhisattva is a really bodhisattva who cherishes the idea of a self, essentially. And it's opening to that understanding of, of who we really are that we can find through beginner's mind that allows us to see how best to respond in each situation in a way that can help, truly help. I just wonder if anybody has any questions about how to practice in that way or if you have any questions about what beginner's mind is. Can you, uh, can you talk more about the connection between beginner's mind and the mind of no self? Yeah, it's not really different, but I think a way that's helpful to think about it um, 
is as a beginner, right? So we're coming to the practice and we don't know how to proceed, really. There are lots of books on it, some more helpful than others. And so just like when you're, you know, when I was learning to play the French horn, for example, I didn't know how to do it. And so I just had to feel it out. You know, I, I tried playing a few times thought I'd pass out and had to just sort of come back at it some other way. And I didn't know how I didn't give up, even though I kind of thought about it. And I feel like that's a, a pretty good analogy for how we approach Zen a lot of the time. We have a lot of enthusiasm and um, we come to it and we're doing what we think we're supposed to be doing. And then nothing's happening <laughs> or lots of things are happening that we feel like aren't supposed to happen, like our brain is, is just flooded with ideas and emotions and stories and maybe songs, music that we've heard, all kinds of distraction, and it's not going the way it's supposed to be going, or so it seems. And uh, so we just have to really feel out how to move through it. So our teachers help a lot with how to work with, for example, distraction, allowing that distraction to be there, and then just going back to the breath each time. That's a really good basic instruction. And that is what works. It's just repetition over and over again, bringing the mind back develops that focus. And then once you've been doing that for a while, and you've been doing session for a while, and you're in the middle of session maybe, and suddenly your focus is a lot stronger. And so you can sort of get to this place where there's a sense of, of, of not knowing that comes up at the end of the breath. There's a sense of possibility. And so you literally just sense your way deeper into that. Like, there's so many analogies, you know, like trying to find your way home on a foggy night with no light. How do you do that? You sense it. Um, people surfing big waves talk about sensing how to function in that wave. If they thought about it, they'd crash immediately. <laughs> and so it's just that place beyond the thinking mind that we all have. It's all here. It's who we really are ultimately. And it can be open to. It just takes the practice of trying. So there's practice. We can do rote practice. It's like, well, we can mechanically do the breath, but that's not going to get us very far. If we do the breath with this sense of like exploration, um, you know, there's this really unfortunate story about the submarine that was lost. So maybe this is not <laughs> the greatest thing to bring up right now, but just the thought though of being in a submarine and you're just exploring these this darkness and you don't know what's there and you just keep going and going and going and going and it gets scary. It gets very scary at a certain point. A lot of fear comes up. And embracing that fear is ultimately what's freeing. You know, any mind state that comes up is essentially an illusion. And I keep reminding myself of this when I get stuck in it. But it really is a matter of opening to it fully, no matter how terrible it feels, no matter how real it feels, that, you know, it comes up it feels terrible, but we want to escape, we want to distract, you know, anything but feel that thing, whatever it is. But once we do sense our way into it fully and open to it fully, there's this incredible freedom that comes up. This, this original mind is what comes up. And that's, that's there all along, but we just can't see it because we're so practiced at looking at the world through ideas about ourself and ideas about reality. So taking a beginner's approach to each moment is what brings us there and helps us live it. So each moment, just having this sense of curiosity and openness no matter what comes up to not 
believe it's a certain thing, but to, to question it and to be open to what might be revealed if we don't sort of buy into it. I'm really trying to explain how to do it. I don't know if that's explained well. Did that make sense? Yeah, no, thank you for that detailed explanation. Yeah, it's really an investigation in each moment and not not taking anything for the truth until you see the truth deeply enough that you're not confused anymore. <laughs> and it takes doing that over and over and over again to really live it. But it's, it's um, the most incredible uh, this whole process is the most incredible thing I think human beings can do. And I feel like that's what we're here for. Life after life, just working through this process of opening more and more fully, letting go more and more. Ultimately, just... Uh, just getting to a place where our life is just about offering and not hanging on to any attachment whatsoever. And it's, it's a very absolute process because anytime you think you can hang on to maybe a little corner of something like, Oh, I let go of all this other stuff. I want to hang on to this, this little bit, then it doesn't work. It's sort of like, the superheroes in the movies when they're trying to escape the bad guy and they're flying away and they just grab the corner of their cape. <laughs> it's like that. You try to hold on to one thing and you're just sucked back into suffering. The suffering created by our own minds. That's all it is. But um, but it is, it is in many ways a tall order. But once you see that that's the way to freedom, then it's an easy choice. It's just one that has to be made over and over again in order to really clear out um, habits of attachment and habits of idea, idea making. At least that's my experience. That's what it feels like. Just an example would be, you know, I really dread doing these things. <laughs> like every single time Roshi asked me to do one of these, it's a certain amount of dread that comes up and a certain amount of um, anxiety, fear, dread, uncertainty that I have to open to. And it feels terrible really terrible. And I think, you know, I really could just try to procrastinate opening to this, <laughs> but there isn't really time. So <laughs> I have to just do it now. And so every time I do, and eventually it lifts, and there's just this freedom there, then I'm like, well, why don't I do this every time? Why do I create all this suffering in my daily life outside of Sashin, you know, when I want to avoid feeling something or distract myself and not be fully present because it's so rewarding to just do that. That being said, of course, it's very hard. It's a very hard process. And I've been doing it for decades since, you know, obviously since I was 10, I've been doing Susokan, right? And it's still hard for me. So um, if that helps anybody feel better about it feeling hard, <laughs> because it is, and it takes a long time. To get to um, well, I don't want to ever want to say it's easy, but it certainly has felt different for 
long enough that I have some confidence in being able to continue to work in this way of letting go more and more. And there's um, a fair amount of freedom with that too. Does anybody have any other comments or want to share anything about their experiences? Well, I hope it's helped in some way. Um, it's a really, really hard path, but the most rewarding thing a human being can possibly ever do. And it just gets more inspiring and incredible the further I go with it. And so I hope just my saying that in some way is helpful and inspiring. And um, sitting with everybody in session is very inspiring for me. So thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows.